Hello, I am Robert Holmberg. I'm a member of Science Outreach uh, Athabasca, and this is a presentation on underwater Hawaii. Uh, this is uh, part one of, of two, uh, two uh, um, sections of this presentation. So in this presentation, uh, we'll, I'll talk about a bit of the geography, the geological formation of the Hawaiian Islands, colonization by marine organisms, a little bit about snorkeling, a little bit about underwater photography. In the uh, second uh, part of this presentation, I'll deal with underwater life of uh, four of the main islands and also what I did not cover. Okay, so this is a illustration of where the Hawaiian Islands are, and they're just isolated in the middle of the Pacific. Um, and this is the main islands that we usually think about as being the Hawaiian Islands. But in reality, the Hawaiian Islands stretch for over 2,500 kilometers. So it's a large archipelago. And um, uh, as I say, most people are only think about the ones in the lower right-hand corner. Okay, the human history is, is that about 700 AD, the Polynesians from Marquis Islands uh, uh, finally started to colonize, uh, colonize the Hawaiian Islands. And then there was another wave of migration about 1,200 uh, from Tahiti. And then the start of the British influence came with uh, Captain James Cook in 1778. And uh, between 1810 and, and 1893, uh, uh, the Kingdom of Hawaii was, was formed. And then, then it would, became the Republic of Hawaii uh, for a short time, and then it was annexed in 1898 by the United States of America. And then in 1959, it became the 50th state of, of, of the USA. Okay, so here are the main Hawaiian islands. Uh, number one, the top, start, starting at the top left is Nihihau, and then Kauai, and then Oahu, and then um, Molokai, uh, Lanai, Maui, this island that I can't pronounce its name, and the big island of, of Hawaii. And you can see the British influence in their flag on the top right uh, of the Union Jack is part of the state flag. Okay, going back to Nihau, uh, this, this is a fairly uh, low island, doesn't have very many mountains, and because of that it doesn't catch uh, the the clouds and so it doesn't have much rainfall. And it's very uh, low uh, human population in this island, only 170 in 2015. And, and that is because it's been privately owned since 1864 by the Robinson family and they, they keep control of the island. So moving to Kauai, uh, this has, has lots of mountains on it and so it catches the rain clouds and, and most of the island it has very high rainfall. And it's got a moderate human population. And then we move down to Oahu, the main island for uh, commerce. And, and um, um, it is also very mountainous in, in a few parts. And so it can high, have high rainfall in certain locations. And it's got the highest population. It's close to, to a million, million people now. Okay, moving down to Molokai, um, it is also mountainous and you can see from, from this satellite image that uh, on the right hand side, uh, uh, the mountains have caught the rain and it's very green and on the left hand side, uh, uh, the, it is, is fairly, fairly dry. So it's got a low human population. And then we move down to Lanai and it's quite mountainous in the center as you, as you can see. And so it's, it's got a moderate rainfall um, and it's got a low population, uh, only around 3000 people. And that is because formerly most of the island was owned by a uh, pineapple plantation. And now it's owned 98% uh, of it's owned by a uh, founder of Oracle. Okay, so we've looked at Lanai, now we look at Maui. You can see it's uh, basically two islands that are, are join, joined together. 
and it's it's mountainous as well so it's got high rainfall in the east and and lower rainfall in in the west and it's got the um, say a third highest human population in the islands and then we're dealing down to this island that i can't pronounce and um it's it doesn't have very high uh, uh, mountains and so it gets very little rainfall there are no humans living on the island because it was used as a bombing rage in World War II and still has what they call unexploded ordnance. Okay, here's the big island. You can see that it's it's got uh, high mountains in various places. And so um, in various places, it's got a lot of rain and it's got the second highest uh, human population in the Hawaiian Islands. But going back to the archipelago, um you can you can see that it 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 really stretches over a large uh, part of the pacific ocean so these northwest hawaiian islands are two-thirds of the entire hawaiian archipelago and it, it they're only 10 small islands plus several atolls with coral coral features and sea mounts and sea mounts are are uh, volcanic mountains that are not reaching the surface and they may have um, not reach the surface yet, or um, most of these though are eroded because because they're very old. And most of these uh, this area are are conservation sites. So if from this uh, map of 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 the ownership of by the United States of, uh, of various parts of the Pacific. You can see with Alaska and the coastal states, it has big chunks of, of claiming to the Pacific Ocean. And then the Hawaiian Islands indicated with the red arrow and other possessions uh, uh, to, to, the, to the west. Now we'll go on to a bit of geology. And if you remember, the earth is divided into three sort of sections, uh, the co inner core, which has an inner part and an outer part. And then the big part is the, the mantle and then the thin crust. And the crust is only five to 50 kilometers thick and that's where all life uh, uh, lives. So the Hawaiian Islands, again, indicated by the red arrow is in the middle of this Pacific plate. And it's, it's the largest plate uh, of, of the crust in the, in the world. And it is uh, st stretching in, uh, in the south and uh, moving towards the Northwest and then it's subducted under under a plate uh, to the, to the northwest. But in the middle of of this plate and other plates, there are these hot spots where uh, lava or mag, uh, magma comes comes from the mantle and reaches through the crust to the surface. So here's a diagram of the Hawaiian hot spot. And um, you can see that the Pacific plate, the crustal plate is moving uh, to the left in this diagram and the magma and is coming up and um, uh, forms volcanic activity. Here's another diagrammatic view of the Hawaiian Islands with this hotspot. But if you look in the lower left uh, corner, you can see the various ages of the islands. So uh, Hawaii is, is uh, only what is it about three quarters of a million years old to the present and it's still expanding today and as you move to the northwest the islands get older and older and older so this is the big island of hawaii and this is um what it looks like above sea level it's got several several large uh mountain volca volcanoes and um, um you can see the elevation changes but if you look at it from the ocean crust, there's a lot more of Hawaii than, than would appear above, above the ocean um, um, surface. So Mauna Kea is the highest mountain in the world if you go from the crust. So it's over 10,000 um, meters above the oceanic crust, but only a little over 4,000 meters is above sea level. So uh, depending on how you um, rate your mountains, it, it might be the highest in, and beat out Everest. Now, if you look in the lower right, you see another arrow, and this is a new activity of, of a volcano. 
So this is a uh, low high, and it is it is it is quite active in forming uh, new land. Now, a lot of Hawaiian lava oozes out quite slowly, and you can get very very close to it. And, and, and this is unusual for a lot of uh, uh, volcanic activity, but also sometimes it becomes very explosive and, and dramatic. This is an underwater uh, photograph of a volcanic vent uh, near Samoa, but uh, similar things are happening in Lohi High at, at times. But most of the lava coming out is, it, it oozes out slowly at low he high, and so it forms this pillow lava, um, which are just large extensions that come out molten rock and then uh, solidify quite quickly uh, with the colder ocean water. Now, another activity that happens with vol volcanoes is these hydrothermic uh, vents. And what happens is, is that the um, water in the substrate is heated, and because it's heated, it rises. And as it rises, it dissolves minerals. And then they, as it gets cooler towards the top, they precipitate out and form these little uh, uh, turrets un underwater. And these turrets can get quite large. And the, uh, this is a hydrothermic vent, which, which is called a black smoker, because you can see in the background, it's, it's producing uh, black material. There are also white smokers at, at various places. Whoops, and all of this, all of this new uh, land under the ocean uh, starts to be colonized by by various marine organisms such as such as this anemone. Now, if we look back at, at terrestrial marine situations in 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 broad terms, um, algae in terrestrial situations there's there's not very much algae, and um, of the, but in marine situations it's the dominant photosynthetic organisms. In vascular plants, it's the opposite. On terrestrial situations, the vascular plants are dominant and there's very few of them in the marine situation. With arthropods in terrestrial situations, crustaceans are the, are the dominant group, but in marine situations, it's the crustaceans. Sorry, did I say insects on land and crustaceans in the, in the marine. And with vertebrates, mammals, sometimes birds are, are the, the main uh, ones in the terrestrial system but bony fishes are, are the most important vertebrates in, in marine situations. Okay, phytoplanic algae are the major source of photosynthesis in the ocean. So they're uh, usually microscopic and um, uh, they produce the food that all the other organisms depend upon. There are, the, there are some attached algae. This is a photograph I made at low tide in Oahu so there are some, some uh, attached algae. But you have to be careful about, about algae. This is coralline algae, and it's easily confused with coral because it precipitates out calcium carbonate just like coral does, but it's, it's, it's an algal a form. And I said there are very few marine plants, and this is, this is one of them, seagrass. Uh, and it's, it's occasionally occurs in, in various uh, places, but one of the few vascular plants has, has reached the oceans. But there are also bacterial mats. And again, we're going back to Lohi High and, and the greenish area in here is, is algae. And this is not formed from photosynthesis, but from a, a conversion by the bacteria from a various forms of iron to another form and it uh, allows them to get energy for growth. But then again, uh, uh, various animals start to uh, inhabit uh, this, this pillow lava. And after, a, it takes, takes quite a while to get a mature community. This is a depiction of a mature hydrothermal uh, vent community. So there's lots of tube worms and crustaceans and mollusks and a few fish and all kinds of other invertebrates. It gets quite complex. Now, if we're talking about uh, colonization, um, how, can you, how can you get to a, a new area that's been formed by a volcano? Well, one is by swimming. So pelagic fish will, will move through, through the ocean and, and uh, find these places. 
Um, but you can also drift in the ocean currents and various larval stages of invertebrates do that. And you can attach to floating things like, like algae or tree trunks even. Snails are an example of that. And then with human activity, you get ship holes. So, so things like barnacles will attach and then detach in a new habitat. And uh, ship water ballast um, will transfer things like jellyfish. And then of course, humans will take things uh, deliberately and, and make introductions. And this has been done in, in the Hawaiian Islands for mollusks and, and various fish, even by the Polynesians, uh, the ancient Polynesians. Now, if we look at the ocean currents, uh, this time it's a blue arrow that indicates the Hawaiian Islands. You can see that they're in the center of this huge Pacific gyre. And this Pacific current moves from the west to the east in the in north temperate areas. And then it hits the coast of uh, North America and, and Central America, swings south near the equator and, and goes, uh, goes towards the west. So the Hawaiian Islands are, are out of the main current, but they still have uh, some things that colonize them. And you can also look at the Hawaiian Islands from the point of view of shallow water communities. They're a long distance from any shallow water communities that are, that are around them, either tropical or subtropical or temperate. Okay, so even if you get to the Hawaiian Islands, is, can you survive there? And so you need long lasting larval stages to survive the long distances. And uh, when you get there, you need some su a suitable and sufficient food. So from other organisms that got there before you, and um, you need a suitable habitat, uh, various things that include substrate or temperature or salinity, all kinds of factors like that. And then you need to compete with, with the residents that are already there. So uh, they also need sufficient density. So if one male enters the area, it's not going to propagate and, and, and will die. And often a lot of organisms need several individuals in order to find mates and reproduce. Okay, so this remoteness of the Hawaiian Islands tends to form a lot of endemic species. These are species that are found nowhere else in the world. It means that long time ago, um, some, some organisms got there and then they evolved over time and, and speciated uh, into, into new species. So uh, there's about 25% of the fish in the Hawaiian Islands are endemic and about 20% of the invertebrates are endemic. These are high numbers uh, for endemic species. Now, if we look at a lot of the commercial beaches, they, they have this nice pure sand and, and whatnot. It looks very, very nice and it's great for sunbathing and swimming and whatnot. But these beaches are manicured every day um, to pick up um, debris that floats in. And if you don't do that, this is what you'd, you'd have. This is a, a back in Nihau. You can see that there's driftwood of various kinds and then all kinds of plastics uh, from humans that drift onto the islands and will accumulate if they're not removed. And this is further north in the Northwest uh, Islands. And you can see this, this small island is, is covered with a lot of human debris, um, especially the round objects are fishermen's floats. And the lower right shows a cathode ray tube, which I can't believe uh, survived uh, floating in the ocean and not breaking up because they're quite fragile. Now, all of this causes problems. There's also uh, um, fishing nets or jets and because they get caught in things, because they break off partially, uh, torn or whatever, and, and fishing boats often just jets and them out and they sink to the bottom. They um, um, uh, entangle uh, various organisms and cause end of pro no end of problems. And these are photographs taken and how they're removed. It takes a lot of time and effort to remove uh, fishing nets and, and other debris. And there's also starvation by plastics. This is uh, an, an albatross fledgling and you it's been, it's died and it, it's been opened up to see all the uh, bits of plastic that it's, it either fed itself or its parents fed it. And this particular bird and there are others similar uh, can't regurgitate the, these um, in, a, in 
um, these objects um, and or and they can't defecate them out and so they accumulate and the 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 bird dies of starvation and this is a um, uh, what has been removed from this bird and if you look closely at the center there's a disposable lighter as as one of the objects so all of this plastic uh, is is problematic to to uh, wildlife now we'll move to a different topic and talk a little bit about snorkeling because a lot of this presentation was done from, from me snorkeling. Okay, so free driving, diving for sponges occurred in the Mediterranean at least 5,000 years ago. And uh, they probably used reeds as the first snorkels. And Aristotle way back uh, um, noted that there were divers who were, who, were, who were using something like an elephant's trunk to be able to breathe underwater. So here's the basic equipment of snorkeling is a snorkel. And uh, it's essentially just a breathing tube and, and a mouthpiece. But today, there's, they become a lot more sophisticated. So there's splash guards at, uh, so the water waves don't, don't go into the snorkel and they might uh, drain. Um, then you have a mask clip for holding it onto your mask easily. Um, there's often a sump and even a purge valve to get rid of water that comes in and makes it makes snorkeling a, a lot nicer. And then of course, there's a mask. Humans do not see well underwater because our eyes are adapted for seeing in air and the goggles um, uh, or mask will, will give you a little bit of airspace. And some of them have interchangeable lenses for people like myself who are myopic and it, um, having um, diopters that are similar to what you use for your glasses really makes snorkeling a, a lot nicer. And, and some, of, some of the snorkeling companies actually have prescription lenses available. And so you if you're going to try and use them, you should know what your diopters are if you travel and wish to snorkel. And of course, fins. I'm not a very good swimmer, but with fins, I can move a lot more efficiently. They come in various sizes. You can get short ones that are used for packing in luggage. Uh, these are medium sort of ones and there's a lot longer ones, but they really include, increase your efficiency at moving through the water and against currents. So this is um, some of the snorkeling equipment that I use. So there's the fins on the left-hand side. I have water boots of various kinds because uh, you, otherwise most fins will um, not protect your, your heels and, and you can get cut on, on rocks or on, on, on on clamshells and things. Um, then I often will use a rash guard or even just a t-shirt to uh, prevent rubbing up against rocks and, and also uh, for preventing sunburn. And again, too, under rocking conditions, it's nice to have some gloves. Okay, snorkeling safety is one of the things you've got to know your abilities and limitations, and you should stay close to the shore or to a boat. Um, retain your energy. Uh, various companies, if you snorkel with them, they'll insist on a flotation device and body heat uh, using a, a wetsuit, which is which is not that that common in Hawaii, but is still occasionally used. And and you have to snorkel with a buddy or or or, or with a group, and beware of your surroundings because currents can drag you off. You could uh, run into rocks. Boats can run into you and jet skis, windsurfers, all kinds of things. So you have to be not keep uh, looking just down with your snorkeling equipment, but occasionally looking up to see where you are and what's around you. And for organisms, if you, if you look at them and don't touch them, they're perfectly safe, but the handling them uh, cause, can cause all kinds of problems. Okay, my snorkeling experience started in 1993 to 95 when I was stationed in Indonesia and I snorkeled um, quite a bit and, and loved, the, loved doing so. And um, since then, I've uh, moved into other parts of the Pacific and the Caribbean. And between 2010 and 2016, I snorkeled uh, around Hawaii. And um, my son was living uh, for about 10 years in, in Oahu, and when we visited, um, he took me around to various places. So, um, oops, and I also like photography, and 
when I first started snorkeling, there wasn't much of options other than getting a very expensive camera and a very expensive housing and the housing often leaked. And um, it, wasn't, it wasn't great. But today you can buy for a few hundred dollars a good underwater camera. Um, these two cameras are, are um, were used in taking most of the underwater photographs in, in this, this presentation. Um, um, they're, they're excellent for, for the money. But with photography underwater, it's, it's, diff, it's a little bit difficult because you're usually moving around with the wave uh, action and the subject you're trying to shoot, like this fish, also moves around. So getting um, a, a clear shot is, is, is often difficult. Also, there's silt. You can uh, stir it up with your, with your fins and also with the storms. And, um, you know, this is a nice photograph, except it's all cloudy with silt. And then using your mask and, and, the, and a viewfinder, you often have difficulty in in framing your, your subject, and you often get in cut off like, like this, this turtle. And also deep water means that there's less light. And when there's less light, most photographic equipment uh, doesn't work very well because you get uh, a lot of graininess. And flash doesn't usually help too much because uh, if there's debris in the water of various kinds, it'll reflect back. Um, and, and not make a good photograph. But also, th whoops, there's also a color shift. So in the deeper water, your color shifts to blue. So you can see in this, this photograph, the coral on the left-hand side is, is very colorful, and, uh, but it's in shallow water. And as it drops off, you can see that it changes uh, to a bluish tint. So that's the end of this, this section. We've talked about geology, geography, uh, colonization, a little bit about snorkeling and underwater photography. The next part we'll talk about underwater life of, of four of the main islands and a little bit of what I, I didn't cover in this presentation. So uh, hopefully you've uh, uh, enjoyed this presentation and um, we'll um, partake with, with the second one. Thank you.